Good morning. Good morning. Let me see your smiles. Good. Now show those teeth off to two people. Go. Again, good morning. Good to see you all here for worship. It's an exciting day, so let me tell you about it and some other things coming up. Hopefully you have looked over the bulletin, but if not, let's do that really quickly. Right after the service is our baked potato bar, um, and just come on down afterwards, and we'll get started eating those taters and filling them up with some fixings. Now, we will have some to-go plates if you need to take your spud home, so just come on down. There's a few extra if you want to come. Uh, you're welcome to. Um, all right, youth, we will meet tonight at 5 o'clock. Um, college and Young Professionals on March 19th. Um, which is two Sundays from now. We will have a lunch, a luncheon, and we will meet at the Hanses, correct? Yes, they're, they're behind me. Both of them are behind me. Sorry, I was looking at them. Um, so just be prepared for that. If you are college or a young professional, you fall in that category, come on. And then do not forget about Wednesday night. Make sure that you sign up if you have not yet. If you need to cancel, please get to Miss Peggy Bob. Friday, I mean Friday, what am I saying? Monday, Friday's after we eat. So. Let's go for Monday afternoon or maybe early Tuesday morning. Skip the Friday part, all right? And it's hamburgers and hot dogs. And I just want to praise the Lord for something. This weekend we will get an extra hour of sunlight, daylight savings, okay? So don't. Don't get here late, all right? Get those clocks changed by next Sunday, all right? Let's begin our service with a time of prayer. Please pray with me. Good and glorious God, we are here in your presence to worship you. But we come with worries, frustrations, distractions, all of that gunk. May you just get rid of it for us so that our spirit is calm and our eyes, our hearts, our minds are focused on you this morning. May we give our all to you. Amen. We stand this morning as we're saying standing on the promises. We're going to do the first, second, and fourth. Good morning and so happy you're here with us this morning. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory. Smiles going. Have a seat. 
During the 40 days of Lent, the Christian church prepares to observe the Lord's passion and resurrection. We examine ourselves as we remember the suffering and sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. In this season of repentance and fasting, we come to terms with our mortality and need for God's mercy. The candles around this cross represent Jesus' life and ministry. Each week, we extinguish another candle as we draw closer to that dark day of crucifixion. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me, and he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at a table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. We extinguish the second candle as we remember the radical inclusion of Jesus' life and ministry. Pray with me. Loving God, help us to learn what is what it means that those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Help us to see in your call to discipleship a radical inclusion of those so many others deem sinners, unfit, unclean, and unwelcome. In this season, as we draw closer to your cross, help us to see in your life, death, and resurrection the power of an all-inclusive love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. How are y'all doing today? Good, good. Oh, I walked outside today, and I thought, it is a beautiful day. Did y'all think that too? The, the sun is shining. The, the flowers are growing. It's such an exciting time of year. Wow, dandelions are And that's right, even the dandelions are growing. And um, what's amazing is if you walk out just outside of our, in the between the church parking lot and the CRG, you'll see just in the grass everywhere, there's these little, beautiful little yellow flowers sprouting out everywhere. I grabbed enough for each of y'all to have one. Y'all want to take one and pass it around to your eyes. But there were more. We could have had one for every person in the room and, and more to, to, to go around. And what I was reminded of when I saw these is that there's something that none of us had to go out and plant in the seed to grow. We didn't have to plant seed in the ground for them to grow. They just, they just showed up, didn't they? And you probably have them in your yard. I know I have them in my yard. Um, and it, it's amazing to think about how God allows these dandelions and a lot of other flowers to grow, even though we don't do anything about it. One time I walked outside here, and I looked across the field, and there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of birds. Now, I don't know if you all know this about my younger son, Leo, who's not here but he loves birds. He loves them. And if he saw that many birds, I think he'd you know, have a heart attack at his little age. He would be so excited. And you know about those birds is that they were down on the ground eating. What, what do birds eat? Do you know? What do birds seeds. eat? Yeah, they eat seeds. They eat worms. What else do they eat? They, yeah, they might eat plants. They eat birds. Seeds. They eat bugs, you know? And all those hundreds of birds had just landed on. Yeah, I know. Milo was a little concerned about them eating bugs. But they do. <laughs> They land on the ground, and they were just eating all these little things. And you know what? Did, no, none of us. Well, yeah, woodpeckers, yeah, they, they, they peck the trees to get bugs, too. But there, a lot of birds, even starlings, they just land on the ground, and they start eating. And the thing is, like, none of us had to go to the kitchen to make that food, did we? They just ate. You know what? That's a reminder. Jesus actually talked about that in the Gospels one time. He said, you know, sometimes you worry. Do any of y'all worry? I sometimes get, I sometimes worry. Do you ever get nervous about things? What Jesus said is, 
don't be anxious. Don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink. Because I want to tell you something. He, he wanted to remind us this, that God so clothes the lilies of the field that even Solomon, Solomon was this really rich king in the Bible. He had a lot of gold. And he says that they got even better clothes than Solomon had in all of his glory. And listen, all the birds of the air, they land on the ground and eat. And guess what? They, never, they don't even work to get their food. And what, here's what Jesus wants us to know. If the birds can eat without preparing their food, wait, did you just hear? No, you didn't. Okay. If the, if the birds can eat, the birds can eat without preparing their food. If the flowers can look so beautiful, even though they don't even uh, do any work to get their clothes on, how much more, how much more does God care about us? And so we can trust God because as much as God loves every single bird that lands to eat a worm or a seed or a bug, he loves you even more. And so whenever we're feeling anxious, because sometimes we just feel funny. Our stomach feels funny. We feel knotted up inside. We, you know, we even sometimes just feel sad. But we can go to God in prayer because we know that he cares for us. Jesus said, beloved, it is God's delight to give his kingdom to his children. And so I want y'all to know that because y'all are children. And God even wants to give you his kingdom too as you trust him by faith, okay? So let's say a word of prayer and we'll go to Children's Church. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your, uh, just your all-knowing love, for your, your powerful love for us, Father. There's no detail in our lives that goes unnoticed by you. And this is a comfort, God, because it means that even whenever we're suffering, uh, God, whenever we're anxious, that you know our anxieties, you know our pains, and you come to us in your mercy. And we know this because you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to become a human like us, to endure the same anxieties that we bear, and yet, Father, but he served you perfectly. And indeed, he loved us by dying on the cross for our sins. You are so kind, and even more kind, because he rose up from the dead that we might have life. So, Father, would you help us to trust you because you are the God who is trustworthy. We pray this in the name of Jesus, your son. Amen. Amen. Okay, y'all can go to Children's Church now. <laughs> to have you join us after you enjoy that baked potato. We're actually going to go ahead and rehearse in the choir room um, right after lunch today. So if you join us, we're working on our song for next week and, um, and our songs for Easter. So we would love to have the one and all join us. So we'll hopefully see you after lunch today. Let's stand again and sing Sunshine in My Soul. If you're using a hymn now, it's hymn 499.
Would you want me to offertory prayer, please? <clears throat> Jesus, compared to others in the world, we are a wealthy people. We pray this morning that you would help us to be generous with what we have and to even more realize that, we, that the life you give us is much more valuable than anything we could ever accumulate. We pray today that you would help us to be generous with what we have. Please bless the offerings that are gathered this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. You. Thank you, Marilyn. Thanks to the choir and Linnell for leading us in song. This is the time in our worship service where we want to go to the Lord together and pray, uh, confident that God does hear our prayers. And so if you would, please bow your head with me and let us go to the Lord now in prayer. Oh God, you are our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. We call today upon the name of the Holy and Blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Would you hear our prayers? Father, direct us. Son, sustain us. And Spirit, would you complete in us the work that God is doing and that you have prepared for us to do? God, as we draw near to your throne of grace today, we want to begin, as we do every week, by confessing our sin. And we do so not because we are fearful, not because we uh, come to you uh, embarrassed, but rather, God, because we, we come to you knowing that you are a merciful God, and in before you there is no fear, because your perfect love casts out fear. In you there is no shame, because, Father, you have delivered us from our sin. And your word says that if we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so having been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, we draw near to your throne of grace today, and we ask for your grace and mercy today on ourselves and upon all those who are suffering. 
God, we pray for those in our congregation who are sick, for those who are not able to be with us today because of their health or because of a family member's health or circumstance. God, we pray that you would meet each and every one of these. Father, I pray for those who are in poor health, that you would, um, God, even today, especially today, would you let them know your mercy and that you're, you are near to them. Remind them that they can call on you in any circumstance and that you also hear their prayers, you hear their concerns and anxieties. For God, you are mighty to save. God, we pray that you would uh, help us as their brothers and sisters in Christ to encourage them. We pray for those who are sick that you would heal them, that you would strengthen them. Father, we pray that uh, you would, as a church, God, would you help us to overflow with the joy that you have given us in Jesus because of the salvation that we don't deserve but what, what you freely gave to us. Would you give us joy? God, whenever the days are sunny like this, that's easy, but whenever the days are dark, God, sometimes we forget. But would you remind us of your care, even in those moments? Father, we want to pray for our community today. God, we pray for all of those who are involved in the work of education, for the teachers, the administrators, for the staff, and especially for the students today as they get close to spring break, and I know that can be a tiring point in the semester for everyone, we pray for your mercy to sustain them. God, we pray for their safety as, the, as students learn and as teachers teach. And God, we pray that you would allow our schools to be places where young men and women are taught uh, what they need for the sake of society. And God, I'm thankful for the many people that we have and the many Christians that are in the school system, and I pray that they would wield their influence for good and for the gospel as they love their students. Father, I pray that you would help us to receive from you all that you're giving us in Jesus. And we ask that you would receive all that we give. For what we return is only but a portion of what you give us. But Father, we pray that you would receive it. And so Father, as we continue in our prayers, as we continue to hear your word and hear it proclaimed, as we, uh, Father, continue to sing, and as we give, we pray that you would be glorified in all that we do. We pray this in the name of Jesus, your son. Amen. Turns out spring was around the corner. You were turning it into gold. And when I couldn't feel you, and it was 
was hard to breathe in. I realized I need you, and now I see the beauty in every closed door, every single sharp thorn, every answer that didn't make sense. What if maybe they were just teaching me to depend on your strength in the dark days? All my tears got me crying out to you again. What if? Maybe every broken place I've been was a godsend, a godsend. It was a godsend, a godsend. Me more mountains that I need your help to move. God send me through the storm. If it gets me back to you, God send a light to lead me when I don't know what to do. God send me to my knees just to bring me close to you. Every closed door, every single sharp thorn, every answer that didn't make sense. What if it may be? They were just teaching me to depend on your strength in the dark days. All my tears got me crying out to you again. What if maybe every broken place I've been was a godsend, a godsend. It was a godsend. A godsend, a godsend. It was a godsend, even when I didn't know it then. Thank you, Bethany. And just thank you for. Thank you for that song, but also just for sharing the gift of your voice and your music with us. It's always a blessing. If you have your Bibles with you today, I invite you to turn to the book of Psalms and go to Psalm 121. Psalm 121. Uh, I mentioned before, during the season of Lent, I'm going to be preaching through the Psalms uh, that are prescribed for the Sundays during Lent. And I want to just say a, a, a prefatory word about the Psalms as we spend time in them. Uh, one of the Protestant reformers said of the Psalms that they are the anatomy of all the parts of the soul. And uh, I think that if, as you spend time reading through the Psalms, 150 books, uh, that kind of whatever human emotion, whatever feeling you might experience at any moment, you will find words if you look long enough there. Uh, another scholar said one time that the Psalms give us 150 things that we can say to God. And for millennia, Christians have prayed the Psalms. They have sang the Psalms, even. Uh, one common practice has been for, basically, for a congregation to sing one verse back to each other. You say one line, you say the next. You sing one line, you say the next. But I, I say all that to say, some messages in the Psalms, they they are going to seem very deep and profound, and some are going to seem kind of simple, but here's what I think the wonderful truth about God's Word is. Whenever we hear it proclaimed, Psalm 121, the message is very clear in this psalm, but whenever we hear it, it brings it alive to us. Two weeks ago, uh, Jamie Davis read Psalm 103. That was the prescribed scripture reading. I had sent that to Linnell months in advance, uh, and uh, she read it, and Psalm 103 is one of my favorite psalms, and you, as you remember, uh, I had lost a friend a few days earlier. So Psalm 103 is a psalm that I read at almost every single funeral that I preach, and it was the word that I needed to hear on that day, and so today, as we go through Psalm 121, you might think that's a very clear, might even seem like a simple message, but even if it's simple, I want allow it to just rest upon your soul today as I read it and as we reflect upon it today. And every week forward from now, I just, I wanted to say that as a word because I think the Psalms are a treasure and it took me years to discover what kind of a treasure they were. And so anyway, 
Uh, Psalm 121. If you've found your place in God's holy and perfect word, I would ask that you please stand, if you're able, for the reading of God's word. Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither sleep nor slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please be seated? Let's pray together. Father, would you speak now for your servants are listening. And we pray for this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. It's hard to believe that in just a few weeks' time, uh, we will all kind of remember, I don't want to say celebrate, it's not something to celebrate, but we will all remember the three-year anniversary of the week that changed our lives. Can you believe it's almost been three years since COVID made us go home, complete semesters over the computer, start working remotely from our houses if we were able to? I think it's a mercy from God that for the most part, right, 99% of our lives are somewhat back to normal, Uh, although we know that it's now going to always be among us, right? Even a few weeks ago, I mentioned I lost my friend. One one of the things that he had at the very end was COVID, and that's always going to be something that we share from now on. I bring this up. I'm not interested this morning in relitigating old disputes, so I just, uh, about, you know, how did the government respond? Was that appropriate? What about vaccines or or not. uh, So if you heard me mention COVID and you started to pick up your ax to grind it, um, I'm going to ask not just that you bury the hatchet, but I want you to go burn it. And I'm serious about that. Uh, We, the longer we keep those axes in hand, the longer that we keep them as a tool in our shed, the longer it's going to be before we can get back to have peace. And so I'm just going to ask, that's that's not why I'm saying this today. One thing that we had to do when we stayed home uh, was we had to convert everything online, and even our, our schools, right? Colleges, send the students home, finish the semester online. My, the seminary that I went to had never offered an online class. They prioritize in-person learning, and they had to go online for the first time in 31 years. Right? But even elementary school students were sent home, and, and especially in places like this area, the internet wasn't really great for that, but they still had to do it. It was hard for everyone. Parents and adults were struggling, especially if you, you know, you normally work at work, but you had to bring your work home. You had to bring your work home with kids around. But one thing that we heard early on to assure ourselves was, don't worry about the kids. They'll, they'll be all right. Uh, they'll ba- they're like rubber. They'll bounce back. So it's, we know it's tough. It's going to seem tough, but they're resilient. Uh, and, and maybe that was true for like a week or two, maybe even a month or two as we finished that spring semester. But what became very clear, especially as students went back to school in the fall of 2020, is the kids ain't all right. And what do I mean by that? Well, again, many of you are teachers. You've experienced the fruit of that, the lost year of learning, it's called, uh, that students experience. But what I want to particularly reflect on today is how COVID has affected the rates of depression and anxiety among young people Just listen to these stats. It's something that researchers have followed for years. In 2003, so now we're going back 20 years, 5.4% of children aged 6 to 17 had ever been diagnosed with depression or anxiety, 5.4%. 2008, five years later, that number was up to 8%. In 2011, 2012, it was 8.4%, so it's steadily increasing. By 2019, listen to this, by 2019, so this is a year before COVID hit, that rate had increased from 8% to 15% of children who had had a major depressive episode, not at any point in their lives, but in the last year. Moreover, 36.7% said that they'd had persistent feelings of sadness, hopelessness, and anxiety. And that was before COVID. You want to know what the post-COVID rates are? These numbers came out last week from 2021. Nearly 60% you hear what I said? 60% of teenage girls 
experienced, reported that they experienced sadness and hopelessness for an extended period of time in the prior year, 60%. Moreover, one-third of teenage girls had seriously considered suicide in the last year. The rates are lower for boys, but they're still higher than they were. And these are just a couple of the mental health issues that are ailing students today. I don't, you may have heard recently about the Asbury Revival. I wrote about it in my monthly newsletter. You can find out information online. But at Asbury uh, College in Kentucky, there was a revival that broke out among students. And tens of thousands of people came to Wilmore, Kentucky, south of Lexington, to see. And college students from across the country participated in that. And what people who went and reported on said, you know, what's interesting about what's happening in this revival the students are asking questions and they're coming to God asking, they're not wondering, does God exist or is God good? That's not on their radar. What they're asking is, does the gospel address my depression? Does God care about my anxieties and my struggles and my identity? And some of you might be here thinking, well, well who cares about those questions? My parents lived through the Great Depression. The greatest generation fought in the multiple wars and they came back and they didn't deal with those Thing. You know, they didn't deal with those struggles. Kids these days need to stop watching TV, get off their phones and social media, and they need to do some, something productive. Now, even if there was some truth to what you said, I want you to ask, how many people do you think came to faith in Jesus Christ because someone told them kids these days? But that, would be, that response would be like to see someone drowning, and they're asking for help, they're throwing their arms out, and instead of jumping in, even though you're nearby, you just say, well, shouldn't you have learned how to swim? It's not just unloving, but it's wanton neglect. And after all, it's not just teenagers who experience anxiety and depression. Many of us have at some points during our life. Some of you might be even in the present. Sometimes it lasts for a day or a few weeks, maybe a month. But sometimes that lasts for years. Many of you are likely familiar with Mother Teresa of Calcutta, right? This uh, godly nun who served in the slums. She died at the age of 87. And you think of her as this amazing example of faithfulness. But after she passed away, uh, researchers were going over her journals and her correspondence. And they discovered that for not just months, not just years, but for decades, Mother Teresa struggled with some of the darkest doubts that anyone could experience in their life. She writes in one place, I'm told God loves me. And yet the reality of darkness and coldness and emptiness is so great that nothing touches my soul. And that's mild compared to some of the other things that she wrote. And, and as we go through this season of Lent, right, it's a season of almost a voluntary darkness, right? No, no, there's nowhere in the Bible that says you need to practice Lent, okay? Well, let's be honest. It's not wrong that we do so. But what it does is for us, it's a voluntary entering into through, through fasting, right, through meditation, through self-examination. We're entering that as we consider ourselves that we are laid bare before God. And so what does God say to all of this? Where is the good news that we can hold on to as we go through this time of darkness and some of us, whether we chose it or whether we didn't? Well, Psalm 121 helps us here. Again, it's, I've said this before. Its message is brief and very clear, but it's one that we need to hear today, namely this, that the Lord is our keeper. This is the word of the gospel today as it confronts our anxieties and ultimately buoys our hope from God that our hope is in him and not with us. Now, I know that depression and anxiety are not just theological problems. It's not just that you need to believe a certain thing about God and it'll, care, it'll take care of all your issues, right? If uh, you're experiencing a depression, I hope that there's other people you're talking to, friends, right? Um, a counselor, maybe even a doctor, you can talk to me. But as a preacher of the word of God, as a pastor who's been called by God, here's what my responsibility is, is to preach the word. And so I, there is a word about this that I want you to hear today from Psalm 121 to remind us who God is. And here's what I hope you'll see today. That though we may be anxious, God is mighty to save and will care for us in every trial as we worship and serve him. Though we may be anxious, God is mighty to save and will care for us in every trial as we worship and serve him. Well, as you look in your Bible today, at the very beginning of Psalm 121, there's this kind of, uh, there's this little line right before the psalm actually starts. It's called a psalm of ascents. That, that's, that's listed from Psalm 120 to 134. 
in your Bibles. And, and what that, the reason it's given that title is that these psalms were a collection of psalms that pilgrims would sing and recite as they journeyed to Jerusalem for different festivals. The one thing you constantly read about in the Old Testament is that people go up to Jerusalem. They are ascending to Jerusalem to Zion because it's, up, it's literally on a hill. You've got you've to traverse through mountainous terrain to get there. They're not super tall mountains. It's kind of like around here, honestly, just a little bit more dry and arid. But the pilgrim is ascending. They're singing this song as they go to the temple. Maybe it's at Passover or at the Feast of Pentecost. Maybe it's for the Feast of Booths. But they're on the way, uh, and they're singing this song. And the psalmist, as they're going on the pilgrimage to the temple, to where God is, they're reflecting upon God's care for them. And so the first thing that we see in, in the, the psalm and, and is that the psalmist is crying out to the Lord, our helper. The psalmist is crying out to the Lord, our helper. He looks up and asks in verse 1, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? And the answer to this question is, well, my help comes from the Lord, from Yahweh, who made heaven and earth. And this is the first point, again, that the God who creates us is our helper, and we can cry out to him. Again, the psalmist, as they're going on their journey, they're looking up the hills because they're walking through. And as they're looking up, they would notice the dangers that are all around, right? Any journey is difficult, but they didn't have, you know, gas stations and convenience stores to stop at. On the way there, they were walking. And as they're walking through the mountains, the, the, the terrain is rough and difficult. There are wild animals. There is the potential of robbers and dangers who could attack you. The sun, the wind, and the rain, all the elements each bring their own peril. As you take that journey, it probably would be about two days for most people throughout Israel. And moreover, the, well, there's one thing that a pilgrim experiences, which is the false summit. So you're going up a hill. And you think, I'm almost there. I can't wait. And you crest that hill and you realize that that wasn't the summit. That was just the first hill. But there's, the mountain is really further on. And you hope that that's not a false summit too. Have you ever been exasperated like that before? You've been in the middle of a trial. It's weighing on you or your family. Maybe it's related to your health or your finances. Maybe it's related to some other circumstance that someone you and your family are dealing with. And you think, I, can't, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. I can't wait for this to be over. And you get to that next level, and it seems like you're at the back at square one. You probably ask the same question, where does my help come from? Remember, this is so critical when we read about help in the Old Testament. To, to say that God is our help is not to say that God is our assistant, right? As if we just need him to, you know, we're the main character in life, and God just kind of helps us along in our lifetime. no. To say that God is our help means that God is our salvation. This is really important when you're reading Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. When, when God tells, uh, he says, I will make for the man a helper fit for him, and then he creates woman. Remember, he's not creating woman to be man's assistant. He's creating woman because man can't do what he needs to do without her. He can't be the image of God all to himself, but the man, image of God is in man and women. To say that God is our helper, again, it's not that he is our assistant, but rather he is our deliverer. He is our salvation. So the question is, who is our help? It's the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. Our help is much bigger than the hills. Our help is more than just higher above the hills. Our help is the one who made the hills. And so we can trust him. All right, the God who is revealed to us in Christ Jesus is the one who created the world and everything in it. Everything belongs to him. And because he is the creator, he is mighty to save. There's no threat to him. He belongs in a category unto himself. Again, consider creation. Right? I don't want you to think about the, the sun that shines, the rain that falls. Right? Think about the harvests that grow. There's all kinds of ecosystem with insects and, and mammals and, and plants and then birds that humans, that you and I do nothing to do. <laughs> we, they exist wholly independent of humanity because God created them. And he has created us. Physics, chemistry, biology, these are all under his domain. And that creation and God's greatest work in our redemption, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, should remind us of God's mighty power. So do we believe that God can provide for our needs? Yes. He's the creator after all. He has no lack. Can God meet me in my sorrow? Yes, he can. 
There's no other creator for us to call on. So notice what verses one and two, notice how they're in the first person. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? Well, verses three to eight actually are not addressed in the eye anymore. It's someone talking back to him. It's like a call and response. So this, the psalmist, the pilgrim, is asking a question, and the other person is his friend who's responding with the truth about who God is. And I think that even this is an instruction for us, because in our lives, we might be the one calling out to God, but we also might need to be the one with our friend who lifts up their eyes to God and reminds them about who God is and that he is with them, to remind them about his provision and kindness. If someone else that you know is having a hard time, they can't see through the fog, they don't know when their trial is going to end, Maybe it's because maybe God's put you in your life so that you can hold their hand and you can help them get from point A to point B. You can, they can remind you of who God is and to pray more than anything. So the God, we can cry out to the Lord who is our helper, but, but we need to be reminded about three truths. And this is the next point today. There are three truths that the psalmist then goes over about the Lord, our keeper, who protects us from all harm. The word here, keep, it's, if you look at verses 3 through 8 in your Bible, it's, it happens six times in these six verses. It's clearly the theme here. And, and for God to keep us means that he is our guard, that he is our protection, that he is our defender and preserver. And so let's take a look. There's, each of the two verses go together. They're these little couplets. And so I want us to look at them one after another and see what it uh, has to say. The first one is that God is always alert so that we will not stumble. God is always alert so that we will not stumble. Verse three begins with the bold declaration. He will, he will not let your foot be moved. What we might even translate that. He won't let your foot slip. You won't totter. We're all prone in our lives to stumbling, whether it's because of our sin or, or maybe we face some form of opposition and we waver in the face of that opposition. But we need to remember that God is our rock and our redeemer. That's one of the true things about who God is. Remember Jesus' parable in the Sermon on the Mount about the person who builds their house. They dig down deep so that their house can be not built upon sand, but upon the rock. So that when the trials of life come, their life is established on faith, not on, on faith, on the, faith upon God himself, not based upon things that would fall away. God gives us staying power because his word is true, and therefore we won't give way before the wicked. All right, God is always watching us to help us. Often we think about God's omniscience. That's the that's the word. That's a you know funky word that just means that God knows all things. He's all knowing, and often that can scare us because it can maybe treat God like He is this. You know, we, we think of like a surveillance state. Well, it is true that God knows everything we're doing, but it's not just because He is the you know examiner who is watching every single thing you do. But here's another thing that God's omniscience means. We need to hold on to this truth. It means that God has perfect knowledge. He knows exactly when and how we are struggling. He also knows exactly when and how to help. Look at this, verse three continues. It says, uh, he will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. God does not need to rest. Right? In, in Genesis chapter 2, we're told that God rests on the seventh day of creation. But that's not because he ran out of power and he had to take a break. It's because he was done. And moreover, he was building in for us a day of rest for creation to observe, that we would understand that work was not made to own us, but rather that God gave us the creation, and he gave us a day upon which we can rest. Right? We can't you just keep going seven days a week and still be healthy. One of the things it meant to rest on the seventh day, to not go and, and harvest your field, to not go and work out there, is that you had to trust God for that day. You had to plan in faith for that day. Right? And even when it seems like God is sleeping, sometimes the psalmist will say this in other places, God, wake up, rouse yourself, get up, you know, get up and do something. It's not because God wasn't there, it's because we don't know where he is and we're just calling upon him in that moment. It's not because he was absent. I want you to think about Matthew 8, verse 23 to 24. There, Jesus gets in a boat with his disciples and goes out in the ocean. And then in verse 24, it says, Behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. Now, notice the order. Just take a look at that for just a minute. Notice the order in which Matthew gives us the information. He doesn't say they got in the boat, Jesus fell asleep, and then a storm came. What does it say? No, the storm came, 
started blowing us around, and Jesus was asleep, right? Jesus was, uh, he's fully God and fully man. He was resting in his human form, but as God, he was in control. The disciples wake him up in a panic and say, Lord, please do something. And it says Jesus stood and he rebuked the wind. That's something that only God can do. Right? There was no risk for the disciples in that moment because God was keeping them. Right? God is different from us, but you and I, we're human. And, and it's important to we think about the difference between God and humanity. Right? The ancient philosopher Protagoras, he said that man is the measure of all things. And in the Renaissance, people picked up on this. Right? We are the standard and authority. Everything needs to be assessed and measured according to humanity. And, you know, you might think about some great things that humanity has invented. Right? Think about airplanes. Right? If you'd have told someone 300 years ago, we, we make this you know, metal box and put wings on it and put, a, put you know, combustible fuel on the inside of it, will they actually be able to go from New York City to Los Angeles in just a couple hours? I mean, they would have you know, thought you were absolutely crazy. You can think about medicines, think about skyscrapers, the internet, things that require a lot of people to build, and you can think, man, does some pretty good things. But consider this. Humans, for all of our power, we spend about a third of our lives unconscious and vulnerable. We have to sleep. We can't keep going. And moreover, even the wisest of humans makes errors in judgment. It's, it shows us one difference between God and us, and it's a reminder that God is God and I am not, and that's actually a very good thing. This, par- this powerful God, he cares for me. He doesn't rest, and therefore he will not let us stumble. He's not, he's not distant and aloof, just, you know, set the earth spinning and just steps back to see what's going to happen. He's intimately involved in our lives, and he's always alert, so we will not stumble. So that's the first truth. The second truth is this that God is our shade, so we will be refreshed. Verses five and six, it says the Lord. And here, in, in your, it doesn't say this on our screen, but in your Bibles, you'll see that the Lord there is in all caps. It's talking about God's name revealed to Moses in the burning bush, Yahweh. The Lord is your keeper, and the Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. Again, it's a reminder that regardless of the time of day, God is watching over us. The pilgrim walking to Jerusalem on his journey would walk through sun-scorched earth, and shade wasn't just a matter of refreshment, it was a matter of survival. You needed rest. I remember whenever I played football in high school, and we'd have you know practice in early August when it's 98 degrees outside and the sun is bearing down, and you're practicing at 4 p.m. in the afternoon, and you're, you feel like you're sweating a gallon a day, and you're drenched from head to toe, but it's hot, and you feel the breeze blow through. It blows through your helmet. You can feel it on the top of your head. It, penetrates your football pads, and it just feels cool and amazing. But that would be essential for survival in the ancient world. Worshiping God for us, when we come here on Sundays, sometimes we conceive of this time as the one time of the week I can come and not worry about anything. And again, I think it's important that we cast our cares upon the Lord. Right? Worship for God, it's, it's more than rest, though. It's, it's also... Uh, it's our privilege and duty that we have to come before God and praise his name. But I do want to say that there is something about worshiping God together in the gathered assembly of the people that reinvigorates us. To stand with the people of God, to sing praises, to hear the word read aloud and proclaimed, to pray together, that encourages us. So even hearing Psalm 121 read aloud might remind you of the way in which God is caring for you today. The Lord is our refreshing The Lord is our shade, so we will be refreshed because he cares. So the first thing, God is always alert, so we will not stumble. God is our shade, so we will be refreshed. And the third truth here today is that God is our guardian, so we will be safe in his care. God is our guardian, so we will be safe in his care. Look at verse 7. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. In the Old Testament, evil is a word that can mean, whenever we use evil today, we typically mean something that's just so terrible and depraved that we can hardly imagine it. But in the Old Testament, evil, just just the word itself, not the concept, but the word itself, can mean anywhere from just bad, like something can be evil and just be bad, and it can mean the really awful, wicked things. But the kinds of evil that we need protection from, we need protection from harms, right, from people and from things that would hurt us. We also need protection from our own sin, right? We know that our hearts are prone to wander, and we need God's care. Regardless of the form or shape evil may take, God can keep us 
and from it all and defend our life. But how can God keep us? I want us to talk about just three practical ways real fast that the Lord keeps us. First, he might keep us with direct divine intervention. As you read through the Bible, you'll see that God sometimes shows up and he changes things, right? Think about the Exodus. God sends 10 plagues upon the Egyptians. He delivers Israel with a mighty hand and outstretched arm, and they're saved. You think about Isaiah 37. Sennacherib's army has surrounded Jerusalem, and Hezekiah prays at Isaiah's behest, and God sends an angel and delivers them from the army. Acts chapter 5, verse 19, Peter's in jail, and an angel shows up and frees him from jail. Okay, so there's ways in which God can directly intervene in our lives to keep us. Another way in which God can keep us is in, uh, just by using the normal circumstances of our life. Right? Maybe you're late from work one day because God was helping you, you know, God was keeping you from a car accident. Or maybe he gave you a promotion so he could provide for your family. Or maybe he didn't give you a promotion because he knows that you would have been under an abusive, manipulative boss and he wanted to keep you from that. Okay, we don't know. This is, this is where the interpretation of what God's doing in our life is, is challenging. But God can use the normal circumstances in our life to keep us from harm. And third, another way in which God keeps us, this is the ordinary means of grace, is with the church, with our Christian friends. Right? God has not called us to follow Jesus on our own with no one to help us, but he's given us one another. And that means on those days that you're having a hard time, someone can encourage you, and whenever you know someone else is having a hard time, it's calling you to encourage others. We should not trivialize our Christian friends. And in each of these three scenarios, whether it's direct divine intervention, working through our circumstances, or working through people, we have to be willing to listen to God's care and to see his hand of love in our lives. Verse 8 says this, the Lord will keep you and you're, you're going out and you're coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Wherever we go and whenever we go, God is with us. It's like what Jesus said at the end of the Great Commission. Right? We want to be a people of the Great Commission, making disciples of all nations as Jesus commanded us. But the last thing he says is, behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This shapes how we pray. Think about Philippians chapter 4, verses 5 and 7. The Lord is at hand, therefore do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Remember this, that though we may be anxious, God is mighty to save and will care for us in every trial as we worship and serve him. You might be going through a trial right now. I know many of you are, and I, I know some of the things that you're going through, but I also know that there are more trials here in the room today than I have knowledge of. Again, my first exhortation would be, if you need help, please reach out. We can pray for you. We can maybe even mobilize to help change something, but we want to care for you. But I also want you to know this, that God is your keeper. God is your keeper. And I think the more you pray about this and the more you meditate upon it, the more you realize it's truth in every day and every circumstance. I listened to a podcast interview this past week with uh, Yvonne Rusin, who is the president of the Evangelical Theological Seminary in Kiev, Ukraine. About, uh, well, it's in Buka, Ukraine, about five miles outside of Kiev. And he said since February 24th of last year, he's had to lead his seminary through war. The day that the war began, his house was about five miles away, and he said, I couldn't get to the job all of a sudden because the bridge had been blown up. So I had to learn how to lead a seminary from afar. They've had students who have been called up to fight in the army. Others have been commissioned as chaplains. Their campus, seminary campus, has been shelled and bombed. They said, he said on our campus, now we don't have windows anywhere because they've all been blown out. Several of their graduates have been killed in the war. And he said this, he said, there's no good news from Ukraine at this moment, but God does work. I don't have a non-spiritual explanation of how Kiev is sustained. It was surrounded by Russians, then the Russians just disappeared from Kiev area. The only explanation I have is that it was God. Uh, he and those in Ukraine now are having to understand, while they're fighting and active and seeking deliverance, that they still are depending upon the Lord. It reminds me of what Jesus said to his disciples in Luke chapter 12. I shared this with the children today. I want to, ref as I come to a close today, I want us to reflect upon this text because I think it sums up one way in which we experience the Lord as our keeper. It says, and he said to his disciples, therefore I will tell you, do not be anxious about your life, 
what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If you're not able to do a small thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you are to eat, what you are to drink, nor be worried. For I... For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions. Give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, and a treasure in heaven that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also." There have been seasons in my life where I had to read that and pray that every single day. And probably the seasons where I wasn't, I should have been. As a reminder that God does care for us. He knows our care even great, even more greatly than we do. And it's also a reminder that we are to, be, we are to live our lives directed to the future. It is God's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. And there's a place where if if we're trusting God, if we're storing up treasures for ourselves that can't be taken away, one day we're going to get there. We're going to see the treasure that God has been storing on our account. And hopefully that treasure, it's not super precious possessions, it's other people. The treasure is God himself. And one day, whenever, whether we die on this earth or the Lord Jesus comes back and takes us, Right, the thing that we will have is God, who is our keeper, the one who delivered us from death by the death of his own son, and who gives us life through the life of his son, who conquered death in the resurrection. We will have him. And we'll live in that land where there will be no more tears, nor sorrow, no crying anymore, because the Lord himself will wipe away our every single tear from our eyes. And so, brothers and sisters, today, let us cast our cares upon the Lord, because he cares for us. If you would, please bow your head with me and let us pray. God, you are so good. And you give us many good things. You care for us. Would you help us to trust you? You know that we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Would you keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls that we may be defended from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt our souls. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who reigns and lives with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Would you stand and sing, Jesus? We just want to thank you. be seated. Just a reminder, we have uh, our loaded baked potato bar ready for us in the gym today, so I hope that you'll join us uh, for our meal today. So as we go, I'm going to bless the food, and if you see people who are flitting about in the gym before you get in there, they're standing behind the tables refilling the cheese and bacon and sour cream so that you can enjoy your baked potato. If they're making sure that the drinks are refilled, would you thank them today? They're all, they've all walked out, so they don't know I'm saying this. So, 
Uh, you saw them leave just a minute ago. So yeah, if you see them, do thank them uh, for, for laboring their time and energy for this meal. And um, again, I hope that you have a blessed week. If you would, uh, please bow your head with me. God, you are so good to us. Father, as we go forward this week, I pray that you would keep us, protect us, deliver us, and defend us. Would you provide comfort to us in our anxieties? And would you show us how we might be a comfort to others who are experiencing their own anxiety? Father, as we go to eat this meal now, we thank you for providing it, and we thank you for the the, the fun. This is going to go to support the children and youth, so we thank you for their presence here in our church. We pray that you would use the funds collected today to bless them. We thank you for the hands that made this food. We pray you would bless them as well. And would you use this food to nourish our bodies and the fellowship to nourish our hearts? God, we thank you, and we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.